You're listening to the Mutual Audio Network. Have a good day. The following audio drama is rated G for general audiences. And now, a faux fiction audio production published by Not a Pipe Publishing. Super Guy by Kurt Klopton. Super Guy, the generic alternative. Less superhero hype, same superhero quality. Chapter 20. Sergeant Shibolinsky liked a good glass of whiskey. But since he was a tad on the frugal side, he often settled for a good enough glass of whiskey. He had discovered a quiet little pub not far from work and more or less on the way home that kept a decent Scottish blended whiskey behind the bar at an acceptable price, and he had started a tradition of checking their stock at least a few times a week. He nursed only one glass per night, not wanting to seem like a drunk, and he knew that with retirement he would have to be even more careful not to let all the free time end up as more drinking time. Or not. It really depended if there was anything decent on television. Of course, that style of retirement wasn't looking as probable as it once was now that his mother had begun to have serious health issues. He thought the world of her, she was probably the only person on earth he could never be mean to. But helping her with her medical bills was really beginning to hurt the sergeant financially. If it kept on like this for much longer, his retirement was going to be much less than he imagined. If he was going to be able to retire at all anytime soon. Money. Unfortunately, it was the topic that most often occupied his thoughts during these quiet whiskey breaks. The sergeant was about halfway through his glass when another patron sat down beside him at the bar. This slightly annoyed the sergeant since he liked this establishment because it was quiet and never busy, like now. So there were plenty of other stools open at the bar and no need for someone to be sitting right beside him. He was debating between scaring off the intruder or just finishing his drink and leaving since he only had a few more sips. Not surprisingly, being scary was winning, the internal debate, but before he could begin to terrorize anyone, the other man spoke. Sergeant Shiblinski? The sergeant turned his head slowly toward the speaker, who was a younger man with well-groomed short hair, dressed in a nice suit and tie. The sergeant was immediately reminded of a stockbroker or investment banker, something slick like that, although his mother would have called the man clean. However, the sergeant could see the dirt beneath the surface of guys like this. Came from being a cop for so many years. Sergeant Shibolinsky chose not to reply, figuring this kept him well within scary territory. Sergeant, I'm sorry to bother you, but I was hoping we could have a short talk said the young man with a pleasant smile. He seemed very non-threatening. Perhaps I could buy you another drink while you listen to my proposal. He motioned to the bartender. Maybe something from a higher shelf? Sergeant Shibolinsky's eyes widened ever so slightly as he watched the bartender reaching for a bottle somewhere in the range of great to greatest whiskey. The man continued. My employer is interested in having a very simple business relationship with you. Just a friendly association built on the exchange of information and money. Very lucrative for both parties. You would provide us with a little bit of information, and we would make sure that your future is very secure, no matter what expenses might arise. He paused and gave the sergeant another smile. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't introduced myself. My name is Alex. Oliver knocked on the police chief's back door at precisely 6.12. As he waited, glanced around to make sure no one observed his arrival. 
wearing sweatpants and a sweatshirt over his uniform and keeping his gloves and mask tucked in his waistband, Oliver had left his car at a park two blocks away. He then pretended to be like any other runner as he ran through the park and along the street until he neared the chief's house, at which point he darted up the driveway and jumped over the fence into the backyard. This last bit had been done at full superhero speed, so he was gone in the blink of an eye, and he doubted anyone would have noticed unless they were specifically watching him. Even then, they probably would have done some soul-searching about what medications, prescribed or otherwise, they were mixing nowadays. Oliver turned back as the door opened. Hello, Chief. Just past six at the back door as requested. Mr. Olson, said the chief, pushing the screen door open. Come in. The chief was still wearing his uniform, but he had taken off the jacket and loosened his tie. He showed Oliver through the kitchen and down the hall to his study. The study was exactly what Oliver would have imagined from the big old two-story house. A lot of dark wood with built-in bookcases a fireplace, and one large dark wood desk. What Oliver didn't expect was to find other people there. The mayor was standing over by one of the bookcases, either closely examining the titles or posing for a portrait. It was hard to know for sure, and Emma was sitting on a sofa next to another woman Oliver didn't recognize. She had short brown hair and glasses, and sat with what seemed a laughably large briefcase on her lap. I'm sure you remember the mayor, said the chief as they entered the study. The mayor smiled but didn't move from his spot on the other side of the room. He believed it was a good power position and didn't want to lose it to just shake hands. The chief continued. Uh, this is Lily, the mayor's personal assistant. He gestured toward the young woman who smiled shyly and shifted the big briefcase a bit. And you know Emma, of course. You have a seat. He pointed Oliver to one of the two leather chairs facing the sofa. A very tasteful dark wood coffee table occupied the space between. Why didn't you say you were going to be here? Oliver asked Emma as he sat down. I don't know. Why? Did you want a carpool? The chief sat down in the other chair as the mayor took up another power position by leaning on the desk. So I guess this is the first official meeting of the Secret Superhero Committee. I'm just joking. I'm not sure why the chief insists on this secrecy, but when he told me earlier that we were meeting, I wanted to be part of it. I even offered to do the mansion, but our chief likes his mystery. There was just the slightest tinge of bitterness in this last comment as the mayor thought about the publicity lost by not having his prize superhero over for dinner at the mayoral mansion, but he resolved to do just that this weekend. Black tie, city celebrities, and his superhero. He could see the cameras flashing like crazy now. Maybe Oliver could bring a date too, like that Canadian super hottie he'd been linked to in the media. I want to start out by saying that you've been doing a great job so far, Oliver. Just great. It was true. The mayor's numbers had jumped right along with Oliver's after his battle with Cyclone. At this point, re-election seemed a given, but the larger the margin of victory, the better for the mayor. If there is anything I can do to help, please let me know. In addition, Lily here has a list of public events and appearances we would like you to attend in the next couple of weeks. I also have a thought about a little dinner next Saturday night, so keep that open. Lily went about digging into her briefcase and handed Oliver a couple sheets of paper listing events. She handed a copy to Emma. The chief waited politely through the mayor's opening comments, still cursing himself for even mentioning this meeting. He had merely been trying to keep the mayor apprised of their progress against what he considered a major crime problem, but the mayor only saw the publicity side of it. He waved off the copy of events Lily tried to hand him. Instead, he grabbed a folder off the coffee table. This is what we have compiled on Cyclone. His history, his record, and that sort of thing. Lots of stuff here, but nothing I noticed offhand that would explain his attacking you or any connection to Milwaukee before now. That alone makes me believe he's got some connection to a Mr. Crime problem. He's got a high-class legal team from New York defending him, and they've already thrown a billion roadblocks to the charges. Not to mention getting to trial. I doubt we're going to get anything useful out of him. Maybe I could talk to him directly, said Oliver, taking the folder and flipping through it. 
Not a chance his lawyers would have let that happen, even if it were agreeable. Maybe Emma could do some more digging into it for you. This file is just the routine stuff from the criminal database. I don't want anyone at the office to see we're interested in this guy beyond what we would do normally in this situation. But I have a feeling this is a good opportunity for us to do something useful. Okay. He finished flipping through the last few pages of the file, and while it would seem to anyone else he had merely been skimming the pages while listening to the chief, he had actually managed to read and analyze the material and agreed with the chief's assessment. He handed it to Emma. I guess that means you can make use of some of that shiny new equipment we have, as long as Roger has it all set up. Uh, see what you can find out about his legal team. There seems to be something odd about that part of it. Emma put the file on her lap. You know I've never done anything like this, right? I didn't get a serum to make me a criminologist or a hero's research assistant or whatever. Uh, just ask Roger. He probably knows some shortcuts or places to look. Or just Google it. You'd be amazed at what's out there. Thousands of hits for Superguy already. A major crime syndicate against us and Google. They don't stand a chance. Oh, that reminds me. We probably need to get something about Superguy on our official city website. Already done. It was added as soon as he became official, and we even have video clips from the Cyclone fight right on our homepage. Lots of hits. Almost overloaded the server shortly after the fight. IT guys have it under control now. And what about all those cool social app thingies, with the pictures in the comments? IT guys have it all set up. Accounts up and running on all social apps, sending out pictures, videos, alerts for appearances, Everything. Excellent, said the mayor, practically beaming. He didn't usually pull well with the cyber geeks, so maybe this would help. That's why I love you, Lily. You're always a step ahead of me. He rubbed his hands together with delight, not noticing as Lily blushed and fiddled with her briefcase. I suppose that pretty much wraps up our meeting then. I want to talk to Oliver about Saturday night. Actually, there is one other thing, Mr. Mayor. She looked at Oliver and mimicked flying with two hands out in front of her and some slight sound effects. Oh, right. Uh, flying. I've done enough already to see that I need the ability to fly. I was wondering if there was enough money in the budget to get me the add-on flying serum. Oh, the budget. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's uh, late in the year and there's not much of anything left. Might be kind of hard right now. Lily had been reaching into her briefcase for the latest budget numbers, but stopped when she saw the mayor's hesitancy. She knew there was money in certain places, but the mayor might have plans for it. The mayor mumbled negatively a little more before finally asking, How much does something like that cost? I have it right here, said Emma, who pulled a sheet of paper out of her own sensibly sized briefcase and handed it to the mayor. He looked at it and groaned slightly then handed it to Lily. She saw that while it wasn't cheap, there was plenty left in the budget to get it done. It was just as if the mayor wanted it done. Oliver watched all this and decided best how to proceed. Actually, Mayor, you might find that it will pay for itself in a very short amount of time. Consider the amount of damage caused during the fight with Cyclone that could have been prevented had I been able to fly. When I got tossed around, all I could do was wait to crash to a stop, helpless. But with flying, I can stop myself in midair without the assistance of large structures. The mayor looked at Lily, who nodded slightly at the point. Oliver went on. It will also make me much more visible. Right now I'm driving around in an unmarked police car. I don't think people are all that impressed waiting for the hero to arrive on the scene in Parallel Park. Flying is much more visible, much more impressive. Basically just an airborne advertisement of your tough anti-crime policy. Thousands will see me flying over the city every day. The mayor thought about it. And the more he thought about it, the more he liked it. It was basically a big campaign advertisement that wouldn't cost him anything out of his campaign fund. He smiled and nodded at himself. And then he looked at Lily. Do we have enough in the budget for this? Lily nodded. The mayor looked at Oliver. Well then, super guy, I believe we'll be getting you off the ground. You have been listening to Super Guy by Kurt Klopton, a faux fiction audio production published by Not A Pipe Publishing. Look for the sequel to Super Guy coming this September. This recording, characters, and the situations within are the property of their author and creator and protected by copyright. 
If you wish to listen to more episodes in advance, search patreon.com, then Faux Fiction Audio, and sign up to be a monthly patron. Or stay tuned until the next week for your free episode. We will see you then. This is Jack Ward, and on behalf of everyone here at the Mutual Audio Network, we wish you, your family, and all your friends safe harbor during these difficult times.